Hello and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And we are so pleased to be joined today by Zhuating Ni, editor and translator of Synopticon, a celebration of Chinese science fiction, to talk about the book. Welcome. Hi, Lily and Sarah. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we start discussing the incredible collection, I can't wait. We're going to have to burn through the introduction so we can start <laughs> talking about this book. So rapid round. Sarah, what's something great that happened? I took my first international trip in two years. I went to London for a week and it was delightful. Oh, that is nice. Getting a little back to normal, huh? <laughs> Maybe. A little bit. <laughs> Yeah, super for you know for these times. Mm-hmm. Ting, what's something great that's happened for you lately? Uh well, actually, this week I found out that coincidentally, as we were talking about Synopticon, that it's sold out. So there's a reprint that's due. It's going to be reprinting. So that's that's really great. Oh, that's wonderful! Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really happy. I mean, at the end of the day, it's kind of people reading it and buying it that shows that they enjoy the book and that's the result. So it's, it's really kind of a reaffirming and a really delightful pers- um, news. That is fantastic. And I'm glad I got my copy before that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. too. My good thing is that I finally figured out how to log into my retirement account. <laughs> which I had been putting off for too long. Yeah, I was on the phone for like an hour, uh, but it's done now. That's good. Worth it. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Definitely get that long-term planning (laughs) sorted. Yeah. So what is everyone drinking this afternoon slash this evening? I'm drinking peppermint tea because it's very cold here. I have a Earl Grey orange that I bought in London and I need the caffeine because I am still jet lagged. (laughs) I just got back uh, two days ago. Yeah. So brain is still, you know, readjusting. Completely the other way around the time. Mm -hmm. Literally the other way around. (laughs) They both sound very tasty. I'm drinking tea too. I'm drinking a white tea, which is summer spring tea usually. And I love all sorts of tea, but after four o'clock in the afternoon, I stop drinking tea because, or any caffeine, because then I can't sleep otherwise. But white tea usually is the lightest of the teas. And usually I find it gives me that little gentle lift without kind of keeping me awake all night. So, so it's nice. Plus it is very cold. <laughs> I just have a hot drink. <laughs> and it's relevant because there's an awful lot of, I, well, tea, of course, in, in the stories in Synopticon, but I feel like white tea specifically comes up a few times, or maybe I'm misremembering. There is a tea called the U- Ulan Orchid Tea in Tiger Moon City. As a huge tea fan, I really love translating the bit where the character talks about the tea. She talks about it at several points. One at a, uh, I think, a fuel station, um, where she refills her car and has that version of the tea in the tea bag, which is not quite the same as the loose leaf version. And then later she uh, talks about it in her best friend's home where she gets uh, the, the most exquisite version of that tea, the ghost orchid. Oh, I like coming up with, an, with that term, ghost orchid. <laughs> and the way she talks about how it tastes and the aroma. It, yeah, I just really love translating I wish that it really existed, <laughs> this man or tea. But yeah, it's, I think maybe it would be quite light as well. Um, so yeah, you're right in that sense that it's <laughs> definitely quite, kind of quite a, like a light type kind of tea. Well, thank you for agreeing with me when I made something up completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Help the conversation along. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and for our final question, if you've read anything good lately, I'm going to cheat and pick my favorite short story out of Synopticon. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> Longtime listeners will know that I absolutely love zombie stories. And I'm going to look up the name so I get it right. 
flower of the other shore was the Mm -hmm. zombie story in this collection and it was phenomenal i loved it so much I think Sarah even texted me when she got to that saying, Ooh, get ready. (laughs) Yeah. I read that. And I was like, A, I love this. B, Lily is going to die. I'm so glad you enjoy that story. Um, It's a, it's one that quite a few people have said they, it's their favorite story. So it's quite a popular one. And when I read this story from the author, I originally was going to translate a shorter one. And then he sent me this one. And as soon as I read it, I actually changed my selection. It is one of the longest ones and it's a novella size. And I think my publishers were not, um, <laughs> yeah, I think they had mixed feelings about <laughs> featuring this long story in the short story collection. But I think hopefully they'll forgive me now that they know it's so popular. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm really glad you liked the zombie story. It had all of the elements that make zombie stories wonderful, but then also obviously in a way that I had never read before. So it was just all around fantastic. I think for me, what really cemented that as one of my favorite stories in the collection was just how powerful the ending was. It was emotional and perfect and really, really fit. So yeah, there is there is certainly a twist to it mm-hmm. in the end and the format changes. And very often I find in Chinese stories in particular Chinese sci-fi, there is a lot of exploration of the perspective, the point of view. So you, you might be throughout the story, you might be with one narrator very intimately. And then it's completely, you switch to a, di- to a different one or to a different view at the end or somewhere in the story so that's quite interesting too and the format changed and without giving too much away (laughs) it it is a nice ending it even though as a lot of Chinese stories like most Chinese stories they they don't have like straight happy endings and that one doesn't not really have a happy ending but then there is a kind of resolution a kind of transcendence to it Mm -hmm. in a way I don't remember if it was the foreword or the introduction to the collection that mentioned sort of that a lot of the stories don't have happy endings the way that Western audiences tend to expect. And so I went into this collection (laughs) thinking that everything was going to be so sad at the end, but a lot of them ended up being complicated, but still optimistic. And I really, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation in that they're a bit like life. Things are often quite muddy and uh, complex. And there are things that are not completely happy, but mixed with things that people know why they happen and they can live with the consequences. And then there is a bit of hope. I think that these stories do reflect that a more complex view of life and existence in a way. I saw a review of the stories and that was one of the major points that while they don't have like totally happy endings, they're not black and white. There are a lot of, you know, events play out in a complex way. And yes, that's certainly something that I hoped the readers can see in these stories. (laughs) I think it kind of brings us to one of your points in the questions where you're talking about what is the Chineseness, what is the the universality of these stories, and in the selection, how did I balance those out? In a way, all of these stories are about kind of humanist issues, such as if you wanted to correct something in our lives, would we go back? You know, who who isn't tempted by the perfect life and what's the next stage of human evolution and all of those things that are quite universal concerns but the fact that they're written by writers from a certain culture who are nurtured by that culture and they will inevitably you know reflect the uniqueness of the culture that they came out of and therefore the chineseness there at the end of the day we're still all people right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah Human. I have to say, one of my favorite things 
was how everyone agreed with me on the definition of good science fiction <laughs> <laughs> that you know sci-fi can be used to explore these concepts i get very annoyed when i read a book that is just fantasy set in space that calls itself science fiction <laughs> and that uh, whereas all of these stories were so really thoughtful and exploratory in a way that was such a delight to read. I'm glad you like them. Uh, I'm glad you find that they were thoughtful and exploratory. I suppose because I, I read quite eclectically. Um, I grew up on classic Anglophone literature and then I moved on to genre fiction. But I read from works that were written earlier, as well as contemporary stuff and whatever is good, whatever the genre. So I think I have a broader definition of sci-fi too so while some of the a lot of the themes are kind of quite traditional sci-fi like ai robots and like space operas and things like that the their treatment maybe is a little more exploratory maybe the perspectives are a little different and some of them are more philosophical so whilst there is still some hard sci-fi elements in there the science in there and those are kind of the macguffins and of the wider themes of the stories kind of on the on the subject of the stories and your selection process like can you walk us through how you selected a story and what a, your criteria were, was for it uh well some of the stories some of the um writers of these this collection i'd worked with them before and others i've read and really like to translate. And I was also really lucky to be introduced to someone who worked for a media agency and they also had a role in the community. So they introduced me to writers that were on their books and were not on their books. So there was a really nice selection to work with. So they came from a mixture of different areas. I mean, there were so many others I wanted to feature, but for a first selection, I thought it would be good to present an overview of the development of sci-fi for the last 30 years, which is since the last revival, things started to, began to flourish in the early 90s, late 80s, 90s, and has continued to grow in a sprawling way, the genre in China until now. So I thought it would be interesting to present the readers with a few earlier pieces, like some from the 90s and 2000s that were published then. And then most of them are within the last 10 years for them to see how what was written 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and and now within the last 10 years. So so it's a, it's a celebration of Chinese science fiction rather than a best of or focus on a particular theme, aiming to present a wide view, as wide a view as possible, a wider range of styles and content and tones as possible. I particularly enjoyed the the diversity in the stories, just in terms of, like you were saying, in terms of tone and themes and publication dates. And content. And content, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really was a, just a delightful, it's been so long since I've read science fiction, and I forgot how much I missed it. it was, oh, oh really? that, that's all I want to do now. <laughs> well, a lot of the writers are published elsewhere. They have a few pieces published elsewhere in English, on mainly on Clark's World, uh, who regularly now feature a translated Chinese sci-fi story. And then in there are a couple of other collections. You can count them on one hand at the moment, <laughs> the number of Chinese sci-fi anthologies in English so it's really not a lot so that's that's also why I brought out this collection to add to the resources a bit more by the sound of it you I gather that you liked a few of the stories because they're so different I know that that they might not not every story might be might not be for everyone <laughs> so but that's the that's the that's a good thing about having a wide range which other ones are were your favorites which other ones did you like did you like particularly um i really enjoyed 
I don't okay. remember the name of it. The AI and oh, it was a- Alex and oh, who was it? What were Ken, their names? Ken and Alex. Yes, <laughs> I loved that one. <laughs> that was so it, sweet. It was sweet, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and I've I really liked well both um, the Tide of Moon City and Starship Library, but really I enjoyed just about all of the short stories here. That's fantastic. Yeah. I would say even the ones that didn't resonate with me entirely, I still enjoyed reading them. Yeah, I I think I would agree with that. They they were all really enjoyable to read. Like some I liked more than others, but there were none that I didn't in like didn't have a good time reading. That's really brilliant. Some readers on Goodreads have said that they usually hate to some of the stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's one that you hated. <laughs> Yeah, and certainly I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't pick any favourites or uh, there are ones that I really like a lot, but they're all like, which one, which one of your kids, it's like, which one of your kids would you pick? <laughs> um, but there are some that express views that were a little bit outdated, particularly in terms of gender and and things like that, which I, you know, found slightly uncomfortable to translate but then I thought it was important to reflect them as they are because it is an issue that female writing in sci-fi in China is very underrepresented it is not because they are women are not writing sci-fi but because of the some of the attitude towards the kind of sci-fi that writing and towards female writers and and gender attitudes too you know in general in society is still an issue so you know there are some that were not my absolute favorites that I thought was important to have in there. I really appreciated though that and reading the the stories I did notice a couple of instances of things where I was like oh this is a little bit outdated but I think that you do a really good job of acknowledging that in your your notes about the stories and I found the inclusion of that to be really thoughtful and thought-provoking. Thank you. I take it you're talking about uh, the return of Adam, maybe. Yes. <laughs> but isn't that a universal aspect? Uh, every every society has some uh, maybe male authors with some outdated <laughs> outdated thoughts. So I actually found that very relatable. <laughs> Yeah, there are certain uh, passages that um, kind of connote the male gaze. And you're right in that it's not exclusive to Chinese society or other societies. It's quite, unfortunately, so prevalent in places. Yeah, so I thought I needed to address that in the notes. I mean, the oldest writer is 70. Uh, that's Wang Jingkang who wrote. The Return of Adam, that was one of his first published pieces. And then the youngest writer is like in her early to mid 20s, the one who wrote Cat's Chance in Hell. So you can see that there's a how, how it's developed. And of course, you know, in of Wang's generation, you know, things were very different and still progressing. I certainly hope that readers can see that and see that in context and not kind of misinterpret it as something that it's my my point of view or or, or something that the publisher is trying to endorse that's not the case so when we when we get to works like cats chance in hell and flower of the other shore by um Achua and Yan Yu, these new generation of writers you can see a lot of actually gender non-conformity and fluidity in the way that their characters in the way that they write for example Nian Yu you wouldn't think that that kind of robot filled gun porn sci-fi is necessarily you know coming from a female writer and then Archer's characters are always you know his male characters are always kind of really really sensitive and you know totally okay with expressing their emotions and you know so you can see a certain amount of gender nonconformity and fluidity in, in their writing. And it's interesting to see how it's developed, the genre, and how subjects are treated. 
so it's interesting to see that development there and and also I thought it was important to feature a rendezvous 1937 even though it's really not a comfortable read <laughs> and loosely historical sci-fi fiction because an area of history that is not covered much and needs to be remembered so one reason why I wanted to feature that story and apart from the fact that it's also very well written I'm glad you liked most of the stories it's certainly been a great journey translating them they're also different and by arranging the order you know I sat there with author's name and the title and then different colors like pink for kind of happy whimsical and then green for like a quite somber and then yellow orange for mm, somewhere in the middle and kind of you know just had a kind of brainstorm and placed them in when I was placing the order of the stories in the collection to make sure that there was a nice variation there for the reader when as they read through so it's not too heavy for them and they get like a, an interesting kind of journey through the book as well. So um, translating so many different voices was quite really fun and quite challenging, but fun. Do you think that you were mentioning that this the book had sold out um, and was going into a second printing? Do you think that, that the popularity of this will inspire more translated Chinese fiction and like more anthologies like this? I really hope so. I really hope so. Some of the authors, after the selection was made, some of them are already bringing out some novels like Bao Shu and, and his Redemption of Time was published 2020. And also Hao Jingfang, who wrote Chen Kun and Alex. She published Vagabond's full-length novel. And then, then there's going to be a few more, like Han Song, who wrote Tombs of the Universe, will be publishing a trilogy in 2023, the Hospital tr Trilogy in English. So I certainly hope it will, there will be more anthologies and other and novels and novellas. Short stories are particularly interesting with regards to Chinese sci-fi, because it seems to be what is flourishing at the moment on the scene. Because, I mean, they're really suited to sci-fi in a way in that you can it allows the author to explore a concept in a limited space in a, in a length and then they can then expand that into a novel or novella if they like the concept more room for experimentation exactly exactly and and all the platforms that chinese sci-fi grew out of were really suited to kind of short stories so we have a lot of nice, we have a lot of great, fantastic sh short stories, kind of you know, short, medium length novelettes and novellas coming out, like a flourishing of that. Not so many novels, although there are more no novels than before. So, yeah, I certainly hope to see more, of, more anthologies like these. And if I get the chance to do another at Synopticon 2020, um, <laughs> insert the date, in Synopticon 2, then I'd have no problem filling it with more authors, um, new ones that I'd come across or I didn't get to feature in the first one. So, yeah, definitely fingers crossed for more, more uh, Chinese sci-fi translated into English. Definitely. Were there any stories that got cut from Synopticon just due to space or, I mean, I'm sure there was plenty that you wish you could have included. Do, do any come to mind? Uh, yes, there are certainly stories I wanted to include that I couldn't. So, for example, uh, Hao Jingfang had a two-part story that I really loved. It's, okay, loosely it's a set in different planets and it has a lot to do with music and music has been a really important part of my life. And, and I really love that two part story, but of course it was too long to include. 
there are others too. Uh, authors like uh, Qi Chi Hui and Qi Qi Yue, who I wanted to feature, but uh, already this is four hundred and fifty pages. <laughs> so, so I'm hoping maybe in the next volume it might be, yeah, yeah, a lot and longer works um, that I'd read about dimensional travel, like a sort of novel novelette length story by Huxi, for example, which I really like loved. So uh, that that one was kind of, kind of maybe more suited to be published as a novella rather than in an anthology. So things like that, and and also Han Song, who's one of my favorite writers, a Chinese sci-fi. I think he has um, a series of three short novels that are a trilogy set in the metro world of China which I really loved and too long, again, <laughs> too long to keep that <laughs> in the Noctocon. So lots that I wanted to translate and, of course, a lot more that I've come across since uh, making the selection. Stories are not only being published on magazines like, um, you know, Super Nice or Sci-Fi World, all of which have their online uh, corresponding sites now. They're also being published on micro bot blogging sites and social media like Weibo and WeChat. So kind of on an almost daily purpose, uh, daily um, basis. So it's almost impossible to quantify what is exactly everything that's being published right now. So lots of new works coming up. And there was an anthology that the Futures Affairs Administration, which is um, a community and a publisher of sci-fi in China, in Beijing. They publish an anthology and um, focused on cats. <laughs> so essay from around the world based on cats and sci-fi stories to do with cats. And I think if there's a sign up con too, and that some of that is definitely might be going into <laughs> sign up to con too. So lots, yeah. I would definitely love to read some stories that that feature or focus on cats. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Actually, that's something I've noticed in new stories. New works are coming out right now at the moment, sci-fi stories. Quite a few of them have to do with animals. You know, either animals who are robot animals or animals. AI cats and dogs and and things like that or or people putting their brains in into animals and it's a it's a it's a popular topic at the moment that writers seem to be exploring yeah so that's interesting you mentioned earlier the challenge of translating so many different voices and styles and I was wondering if the authors had any uh, involvement in that process. Uh, it sounded like they had maybe some input in the notes afterwards. Yeah. So I am in touch with all 13 writers and talk to them on a regular basis. So um, I work with them very closely. And one of the things I've enjoyed about the this whole process is it's a very collaborative creative process so some of them were not so not as involved as others some of them preferred to just leave the translation to me which and I really appreciate that trust others speak a bit more English and they wanted to see the drafts the translated drafts and I sent to after my initial translation and, and review and they sent back their comments or actually before that, I might have some, when I go through the review stage after the first draft, I might have some fine points that I need to discuss with them. So I send a message. I'm very thankful for all these apps <laughs> and social media, which really shortens the distance between people who live on the other side of the world. Uh, so I ask them about this, whether it's a logistical point of the story or the fine meanings of a phrase or a word. 
so we discuss that and then I finalize the review and then also at the at the later stage when I send them the draft they come back with some comments and then we discuss that yeah so some have been more involved than others but moreover it's my role as a translator to carry over the voice of the authors so whether it's a um, kind of jaded hard-headed kind of protagonist or a kind of very romantic and an emotional protagonist or you know whatever the voice is um, it's my role to reflect that and carry that across in the English version and I think that you do in the translator's attempt to accurately translate the language as well as the tone that does carry through but as one translator for all the all of these very different stories there is a danger that they will tend to sound like me my voice so what I've introduced is this process what I've I worked out is this process of I call marinating <laughs> in the work of some English authors that I find that they um, share a commonality of style or I read some of their works to immerse myself in in their voices and then before I before I go on to the next story you know so it, it clears my mind of the previous one and I can I immerse myself in the in the tone of the next one. One example is Cat's Chance in Hell, where my copy editor uh, recommended that I read the Rogue Trooper comics from 2018, and which coincidentally is also published by Rebellion. So it's great that they've got that story. And I and I read some issues of that, and I really loved Rogue's voice in in that in those comics and I think that's who I based Joe on Rogue's voice of course it's his own voice I mean but it's it helps to have a similar kind of tone in mind almost like a palate cleanser yeah exactly like a palate cleanser yeah Mm -hmm. so you've been working I believe as a translator for a number of years right can you yeah talk a little bit about how you first got into into that work yeah so translating has been really a process that's kind of quite natural to me I was born in uh, South, South China and emigrated to London at the age of 11 and so that's like halfway half my upbringing in China and half my upbringing in the UK although I've lived in the UK ever since I've uh, made regular visits to China so I'm kind of immersed in both the culture of my home both country and the culture of my adopted country and and also the well global culture as a whole (laughs) there's a certain amount of global culture that we all share in the anglophone world so yeah in a way translation has felt like a process that I that I always done whether it's you know making friends or like going about the day or kind of doing my cultural writing or translate or actually the literary translation so it's it's felt quite natural my mother was an interpreter and and it's interesting that I've I suppose I've kind of when I was very little I just thought that was really cool um and so I've ended up kind of taking that a bit further a step further into literary translation and I really started to want to do something related to encouraging cultural exchange when I graduated from university which was quite a while ago and so that's when I actually first started translating I did comics at the time or whatever I could find I did lots of examples of genre fiction after going to China to do some postgraduate studies and having seen the genre fiction the nascent genre fiction coming out of that did 
lots of examples and whatever I could find. So that was like when I began in about 2006, five. And then the writing kind of took off more, the cultural nonfiction writing. And now I returned to it. So, yeah, it's kind of been a journey round and back, really. I think at the time it was a it was more tricky 10, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. It was a bit more tricky with Chinese translation in that translation of Chinese literature because the world was still coming to terms with contemporary China as a concept and probably prefer to think of it as the land of dragons and terracotta warriors. But not so now. We have lots of things. We have like films that have on international release. We have a sea drama and the legions of fans around the world of, of sea drama, Untamed, Word of Honor, etc. And then the other aspects of uh, society and economy too. So I think people are, and of course, the, we have the diversity movements generally happening in businesses and on all levels of society. Uh, so the, the climate is a lot more friendly to, to, I think, translated fiction and translated Chinese fiction. So, yeah, so it's taken me 10 years to, to get this project off the ground. I first had the idea of bringing genre fiction over from China into the Anglophone world around 2008 and nine, when I went went to Beijing to study and saw all this cool, um, like kung fu fantasy, tomb raiding, and thrillers coming out on the bookshelves in the bookshops that the rest of the world were not aware of. I'm really glad to finally be able to get this project to bring it into realization it's not something that i've you know specifically gone out and studied in a way it's it's felt very natural to me and part of my wider work as a cultural writer and i think for me i always try and bring that into my translation whether it's um adding a few footnotes here and there or uh, writing some short little guides or in the intro I realized in my excitement to start discussing Synopticon, I didn't actually ask you if you've read anything good lately, but now I want to ask you if you got the idea of translating science fiction work because that's something that you enjoy reading in your spare time or yeah, like what, what, what do you read? Is this the kind of thing you read to enjoy? Well, I read a bit of everything really. (laughs) Yeah. My TBR list is you know this monstrous thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh all the with all this uh my textual list and all the images of the covers i've saved in a folder yeah so i read a bit of everything i like non-fiction and fiction i'm reading some some fiction in chinese so just to talk about what i'm reading at the moment i've just finished we Hunt the Flame by Hafsa Fazal, um, which was brilliant. Uh, such a fun read and really a privilege to have this voice in um, YA fantasy and to be able to not only read a story from that culture, but also enjoy the different ways of expression and metaphors and etc. So that what I've just finished. I'm also reading a web novel called Bandits. You may have seen the series, uh, a web novel from an app <laughs> uh, in Chinese, but you may have seen, know it as The Legend of Fei. It's a TV series of wuxia kung fu fantasy. And it, I love the series so much that I started reading the novel, which is even better. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. I've just finished a book of essays. It's here, actually. <laughs> this this book, which was really eye opening. Oh, that sounds uh, fascinating. Uh, it's not about the burqa, about Muslim women's perspectives. Uh, so, yeah, all, all kinds of things. And I'm doing some research on kung fu fantasy stories at the moment. Uh, so a bit of everything and what things I'm looking forward to in 2022 
um, are things like um, the Daughter of the Moon Goddess. That just came out, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Just came out, yeah. So uh, it's, yeah, it looks so good. And and I wrote about the the moon spirits in my last book, From Kuan Yin to Chairman Mao. And I think this would definitely be an update. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, the chapter includes the not only the history, but, but also their contemporary the popularity contemporarily that they enjoy and how they appear, how that their relevance. So this would definitely be an update. Yeah, and I think things like JD JD Chang's Monkey Around, Monkey mm. Around. <laughs> Which takes place in San Francisco. Right, yes. Yeah. And Sarah's happy because she lives there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For context. <laughs> that's that's yeah. why I'm excited. I actually I oh oh I see. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that might be the case. Yeah. Uh have you read it? I own it. I haven't read it yet, but I picked it up because it looked interesting and it took place, you know, in a in a city where that I'm familiar with. So I was like, I yeah. I want to read this. Yeah, it sounds really good and exciting. Kind of quite nice to have an urban fantasy that's mm-hmm. based in Asian culture and in Chinese culture mm-hmm. um, the character another evolution of another story I've looked at before is Journey to the West about the Monkey King and how it originated how it has evolved in pop culture in film tv series manga comics manhua etc to present day there's even a musical and now and and of course it's one of the characters that's made it into the west it made it outside china so kind of in things like um jean luan yang's american chinese comic and other things other things like dragon ball <laughs> that's what i was going to say but i didn't know if that really counted <laughs> oh, yeah, it counts it counts it definitely counts yeah you have quite a few characters you have goku you have even though yeah you you have the pig demon pixie <laughs> um uh, oolong that is oolong isn't it the pig demon and then you have boma who is the who is like the monk Except she's so, she's very feisty. So that's not like the monk, but <laughs> it is in fact a, a journey of four. And actually Goku is more like the monk because he he sees the good in everyone that he fights <laughs> and upgrades. <laughs> and they eventually, even Vegeta finds a vestige of good in him, <laughs> in him, himself. And, you know, and that's a kind of, process that goes right back to the original pilgrim's journey and in the character of the monk who never sees any bad in anyone who is always nice even though the demons are trying to eat him (laughs) (laughs) to gain immortality so yeah that so that's definitely uh an evolution of part of the evolution of the monkey king in journey to the west yeah uh digressing here so one of the (laughs) jd jang monkey around is something I want to read uh, so many other things and I'm not on the internet all the time uh, because I don't know not I guess not in that generation and need to do quite a lot of research on reading for research so I'm always quite reliant on my friends who are on the internet more to make recommendations so yeah if you have anything to recommend please tell me <laughs> and I'll put it on the list for reading for pleasure my reading to for pleasure space <laughs> don't ask sarah she'll just hand you a stack of book <laughs> names and you'll never finish them <laughs> i might not <laughs> i might not read more of them but um, <laughs> yeah i have i have so many books that are on my tbr that look interesting or compelling and that i want to read too many too yeah. many to name <laughs> i just i'm on twitter all the time and i'm constantly adding books to to the list oh yeah book twitter you can just be on there for, for days mm-hmm. i mean you can be on there all the all day and see lots of recommendations mm-hmm. yeah it's it's fantastic that there are kind of that there is now getting to be fic, 
fiction and books for everyone and certainly more diversity in publishing kind of stories from other cultures and also uh, featuring kind of a queerness and other kind of diversities so that's great yeah I definitely feel like the genre as a whole is a lot more diverse than it was when I was reading as a child yeah which is just fantastic I, like there's still a ways to go I think but we're making steps in the right direction well, we'll never be done with yeah, progress yeah. I don't think that's yeah. a bad thing <laughs> are, are, are you speaking of the science fiction genre or the science, science fiction and fantasy like the SFF um, which is primarily where I stay in terms of reading but all of it really <laughs> yeah yeah it's certainly I think with science fiction and fantasy and speculative fiction because all fiction is based on speculation in a way <laughs> um, I think certainly with that you have more tools in the box to play with in in terms of fiction that's definitely true in that you don't have to stick to the real world rules <laughs> mm-hmm. that's what makes it so fun pivoting back a little bit to translation and your work do you find that translating science fiction differs or not from translating other genres uh yes and no i mean i might be looking up the martian close approach or you know twin planet libations uh astronomy rather than say a book on clothes making for example (laughs) so I'm referencing different things and need to have a different kind of vocabulary but I'd say probably not specifically more more challenging than translating other types of fiction and literature certainly I would hope that because the reader is reading science fiction or fantasy they would be more open to cultures that are different from their own because they're already ready to enter a different world to the one that they're used to so that in a sense I think science fiction is really good window into into other worlds really and and you did such a fantastic job of making these stories and the collection as a whole so accessible I will admit it was a little intimidating to pick up the book just because I have no context or baseline information about Chinese science fiction, but it didn't end up being a problem. And and knowing that baby Lily with absolutely zero context was the target audience for the collection made it so much less, not stressful, but much easier to engage with the content. I know in your introduction, you had mentioned wanting to avoid footnotes. And I was uh, wondering how you decided which elements needed more explanations or maybe sort of clarification in your editor's notes and uh, which things you trusted the audience to pick up on their own? So I would say terms that are specific to the Chinese. So for example, uh, yi guan zhong, which is um, a coffin without a body from tombs of the universe. A coffin that for whatever reason, does not have the body in it, but only the burial rites in them. That is quite a specific concept that readers are very unlikely to have come across. So I put a footnote there for that one. In other aspects, I suppose um, words that can be explained in a in within context. I haven't put footnotes because I could say this word comma and then the meaning in the in the sentence and therefore put it into context subtly without interruption and it would work on its own in as part of the main text. It's hard to uh, come up with an example (laughs) really with everything I can think of I put footnotes for. Are there any ones that you found in the text that didn't have a footnote <laughs> footnote that, that you've understood it's kind of like asking to prove a negative right because i didn't even notice it because i, I was reading 
Oh, that's that's great. That means you you didn't feel like you were interrupted. So, for example, concepts like um, uh, 前辈 the term the Chinese use to refer to somebody who is older than oneself as a term of respect, like sensei, uh, equivalent in in Japanese would be、um, probably a lot better known. I would put a footnote for the first time and leave it. Rather than footnoting it every time, so so that it's not too intrusive, that is still a specific term to the culture, which belongs to the footnoted category and not the not footnoted category. But that's the the beauty of how well you worked it into the text. I I can't come up with any examples because I didn't notice them. They were just part of the story. I would say. The footnotes that I appreciated the most were explaining literary references that there's no way I would have gotten, <laughs> but really did add such really like wonderful background information to the stories and and helped frame sort of what was going on. I really loved those and the historical ones I think as well. So is it like the the ones in the Return of Adam and in Rendezvous 1937? Those, oh yeah, I think also would have been the hardest to look up on my own. Some things you can Google、yeah. and get an answer pretty easily, but things like that, I think, would have been more more difficult to know if I was finding the right thing. So those I found very helpful. Thank you. I've noted that for future publication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that because I'm a culture writer, I always find kind of history and kind of culture interesting, and I think the reader might too. So I put a footnote. Explaining the wider context or the history that the reader can either read or they don't have to if、um, they'd rather just go on with the story. So there was in Rendezvous nineteen thirty seven. There was a character that's mentioned in the poem who is from the Three Kingdoms romance of Three Kingdoms novel. And then there is in My Shame Met the Peril the Anna Wu story. The poem that is quoted at the end is from, and I explain the context in the story in the footnote because I thought it was important, provided some insight into why the poems are there, why those two lines are there, and things like that. Really, I find interesting. I'm glad you you find them too, ideal readers, <laughs> ideal readers. <laughs> Thank you. You did an incredible job of. Anticipating, I would say, a reader's questions in in the footnotes and also in your editor's notes at the ends of each story, you answered most of the questions I prepared for this interview. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> I would write down a question as I was reading and go, "Oh, she already thought of that." <laughs> All right. <laughs> I have spoken to some academics who have said that they are finding it. To be too much handholding, and you know that's totally fine, and that's totally entitled to their opinion. But this, I've tried to make this as accessible as possible to people who are new to Chinese sci-fi, but also hopefully, the introduction is the choice whether to read or not. I think it does give some kind of insight into my intentions, and, and then the, the the notes are. At the back, so they're not before the story to tell you what to think about the story. They're at the back, so you, you can read them or you don't have to read them. And then the footnotes. So of course they're completely the reader's choice whether they they want to read them or not. <laughs> And most, yeah, most people I've spoken to have. Told me that they have found them really useful, interesting, and going back to what you were saying before, I did have some extra conversations with the writers of each story about how they came to write the story, you know, what they were thinking at the time, what they were experiencing in their lives at the time, why they wrote the story, and what they were trying to explore. And I think it's it's like.、Um, Those extras on the DVD, you know, as the bonus material on the on the DVD, some interesting tidbits on if you really enjoy this story. So, you know, my intention is to bring more stories for people who've read a little bit of Chinese sci-fi, but you know, but also to introduce people who are new to Chinese sci-fi to this genre without making it very daunting. So, it sounds like I've. 
done that and and I'm really glad. <laughs> I certainly needed my handheld. I'm sure there's tons of people who don't, but like you said, they don't have to read the notes. That's fine. I needed it desperately. <laughs> I appreciated it very much. That's totally okay. I'm there to <laughs> I'm there to hold your hand. I'm there to help. <laughs> and it's interesting that very much in in my last book, my 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 book of Chinese deities from Kuan Yin to Chairman Mao, when I was discussing this with the publisher, we kind of agreed on the term is that I was there talking to a group of friends about these deities and having a nice conversation over a cup of tea. That was supposed to be the tone, although it was a lot of research went into it. And that's based on other people's previous research and some primary materials. So I wanted to, it to have the breadth and depth, but the accessibility. So that's my sort of usual tone is a, a friendly voice there to help the reader along, guide them or, you know, there if you have any questions. To avoid spoilers for some of the stories in Synopticon, please skip to 12106. Hello from the future. Which is actually the past, if you're listening to this. Yeah, that's, yeah, I was going to follow up with that. (laughs) I'm sorry for ruining your uh, joke. It's all right. (laughs) Thank you for being on the same wavelength. But yes, this is a coda, which we would not normally do. But after we recorded our interview with Xu Ting, she mentioned that there were two stories in this collection that she doesn't normally get a chance to talk about. And so she asked if we would include some of our thoughts. And uh, I'll never say no about giving my opinion. <laughs> so we're going to discuss The Tide of Moon City by Regina Kanyu Wang and Mieche Met de Parel by Anna Wu. I was trying to copy the Wikipedia lady pronunciation for that. Um, that's the girl with the pearl earring, but we'll get there in a second. I think we should give some spoiler tags up front. This section is going to have spoilers because we're actually uh, going to be discussing the stories a little bit in depth instead of the translation process because I don't, I don't fucking know how the translation process went. <laughs> it's just us. So all that's there for us to talk about is the stories themselves. Tide of Moon City was one of my favorite stories in this anthology. I really liked how it felt like we got a lot of hard science fiction but it wasn't incomprehensible. It was really the perfect balance to me, I think. Yeah, like it felt it felt like that perfect intersection of understandable, but also space. (laughs) Also, but also some science in that (laughs) thigh. Yeah. (laughs) And it also really felt there were a lot of very familiar aspects like the, you know, university politics and the global tensions or interstellar tensions, interplanetary <laughs> tensions. Well, one of them is the moon. <laughs> well, they both no, think both that moons. each other is the moon. Right. Yeah. And that just kind of pissing contest felt extremely genuine to me. Yeah. <laughs> you're the moon and we're the planet. No, you're the moon and we're the planet. <laughs> and there was also like that that contrast or that push and pull between like the personal and the political relationships and how that affects the characters and their motivations. Would you call it a tide? You know, (laughs) yes. (laughs) Yes. So this story takes place between graduate students-ish. Ish. Close enough. Well, they are not like undergrad students. They're, They're clearly experts in their fields doing research and stuff, but still in the student sphere. <laughs> and the main character, well, there Diane. Yeah, I was trying to, to figure out how many people I would declare a main character. <laughs> I think There's... Diane is the main character and everyone else is secondary. And you have some characters who are more secondary than others. Oh, well, she's the perspective character. So that's true. You can't get more main than that. Uh, unless it's Sherlock Holmes, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I would argue that her roommate 
whose name I have also forgotten. Eileen. Thank you. And her love interest. He's secondary to Eileen. I didn't care about him as much. He definitely gets less page time. That's not his fault, though. That is specifically not his fault. <laughs> Yo- Yogia? I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. I would say that the three of them are the main characters of the story because a lot of the actual conflict revolves around the interpersonal relationships between the three of them. I have mixed feelings on that. <laughs> <laughs> when I started reading this, I, I was so happy that we were seeing like a supportive relationship between to women who had very different interests, experiences, that Eileen and Diane are the classic introvert-extrovert dichotomy. And it was nice seeing them kind to each other and support each other. And I think I got too invested in that because then when that turned out to not be the case, (laughs) uh, I didn't like it as much. Unsurprisingly, I disagree with you a little bit. Not that they don't have issues, because they certainly do have an interpersonal issue that is essentially the plot of the book. Mm -hmm. But it didn't bother me, and it didn't bother me because I think that you see it being set up from the very beginning. Like, it's telegraphed. It doesn't just come out of nowhere that Eileen has this problem with Diane being the focus of Yoja's interest. Yeah, I mean, it does. And, And they still... Like, they're still friends and they still care about each other. And even though they have this, like, even even though she essentially sabotages their relationship, like, at the end of the book, not book, end of the story, <laughs> Diane is still thinking, well, you know, yes, you did this thing, but how could I, like, ever be mad at you? You know, I value our relationship so much, even though we haven't really talked in 30 years. I think I really did just get too too excited about the way their relationship was portrayed at the beginning, where, you know, Eileen is very outgoing and she uses that to get Diane out of uncomfortable situations. And I was like, wow, this is a story where the party girl isn't getting slut shamed. And then that kind of changed pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she's getting slut shamed. She flirts with boys so she can pass her classes. And I don't think that that is uh, portrayed in an understanding way. Well, okay. That's true. Um, There's a lot of judgment was, there. <laughs> right. But that like, that was there from the very beginning. Right. And then we started to see a redemption where, okay, you know, yes, maybe she's not super academic. Maybe she does have a lot of casual relationships with men, but she does really genuinely care for Diane and is helping her. And without trying to serve herself, she's not only exploiting people in her relationships and then (laughs) not so much. I don't know. I mean, like I said, it didn't, it really didn't bother me at all. I can, I can see why, why you would uh, be. It was just disappointing. Yeah. I thought that it was one thing and then it was another and it was the exact thing that I thought that it was standing up against. Uh, so, yeah, I was, I, was, I was let down by that aspect of it. One of the things I enjoyed about it, though, was that even though, yes, it was that, it's also kind of turned on its head in the sense that, as I said, in the end, like, Diane doesn't care about it. With the, with the perspective all of these years, you know, that they've lived since then, she still values their friendship. And she still feels very strongly about Eileen. Like I said, I thought this was going to be a redemption arc for Eileen. And so it not being that, it, that would have been really nice. I would have really loved that story. I liked this story too. It's just not what I wanted it to be. That's all. Yeah, I didn't have that problem. That I like made that very clear. <laughs> I liked the story a lot as it was. Yes. <laughs> Part of what I liked was that there was a lot of tea in it. <laughs> oh, there was so much tea. And, yeah. Oh, this is going to be weird for listeners because this was like 10 minutes ago. But I believe in our conversation with Xu Tang, she mentioned that translating the descriptions of the tea in this story was an enjoyable thing for her. And I got to say, reading the descriptions was an enjoyable thing. She, she says something along those lines in the note to the story as well. It is interesting how 
this story takes what I consider a cornerstone of good science fiction, (laughs) which is a sort of complex ending where things are neither good nor bad, but then applies it to an interpersonal context to explain better. (laughs) I think really good sci-fi is neither completely optimistic or completely pessimistic about the fate of humanity. It, It is sort of tempered or complex in some way. And in this story, Sarah, like you mentioned, it takes that sort of complex, bittersweet, emotional journey and it applies it to the relationships between Diane and Eileen instead of just and the, the fate of humanity. Between Diane and Yoja. Oh, I don't think that was too. I think well, that was... because because for the bulk of her time she believes that he's betrayed her. Not the bulk of the story though. Not the bulk of the story, but like 30 years pass between the like yeah, in like one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> but but still, I think there's something to be said for the realization that he actually didn't betray her. He cared for her. He was genuine this entire time. And now he's dead. Like, that's definitely a kind of bittersweet feeling that I think fits with what you're saying about the fate of humanity in, in most science fiction stories. Good science fiction stories. Good science fiction <laughs> stories. <laughs> No, you're right. I think the him being dead is the, or all of all of their lost time together, is is the bitter part of that suite, because she. Oh finds yeah, out, it's it's definitely the bitter part. <laughs> well, everything about their actual relationship turns out to have been entirely wonderful the whole time. It was just circumstances that was bad. Right. right? But there the, was no. There was nothing bitter about their actual relationship. But but the fact that she doesn't discover that until he's already passed away. Yeah. Like three years after he's passed away. Yeah. And that no, he's he's sad. been he's been writing to her this entire time and she's not known it because like his letters to her have been confiscated. Like it's definitely bittersweet. Oh yeah. I. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just splitting hairs over, like that. That's their situation, not their relationship. But that's not a helpful distinction. So, I mean, I think it it all comes out to the same thing in the end, Mm -hmm. in this case. So (laughs) another thing that I enjoyed about this was that there's a really strong mythological influence, which I only I, I think I probably only picked up on the basics because I don't have a very strong grounding in Chinese mythology. But it does have a lot of parallels with, you know, the the story and about two lovers who can only meet once a year and they're separated. And Zhu Xing talks about this in the notes and in her, in the footnotes and in her editorial note. But I thought that was a really lovely touch that, I don't know, I, I enjoyed seeing that in fiction. I always really love sort of discovering new story, new stories through stories. That's a bad sentence. I mean <laughs> it though. Discovering new archetypes and mythologies through reading the stories that reference them that's that's my favorite way to do it (laughs) and I also liked having it pointed out for me (laughs) yeah I mean I think I think having it pointed out is helpful for cases like this where you know we're not familiar with with the references that are being made or not as familiar with the references that are being made but it's yeah it was nice I liked it. Again, it's that kind of bittersweet thing that I really enjoy. The next story we're going to talk about, and I'm only going to say this once, (laughs) is Mejumet de Parel by Anna Wu. This is the Dutch name for the painting The Girl with the Pearl Earring by Vermeer. And this, this story shares the same name. That painting is heavily referenced in this, which I loved. (laughs) In her editor's note, Shua Ting mentioned that the references to Bach made this story particularly endearing to her. And I had a very similar experience just because my art history background with Vermeer and, and this painting in particular made me a it, it just gives you an extra layer of warm and fuzzies, you know? I guess. <laughs> you don't think recognizing something that you're particularly fond of in work? No, I think I think that that does. I just don't feel the same way towards that painting in Vermeer. 
Oh yeah, no. I <laughs> so it's a very me specific <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it was good. It was a reference I understood. <laughs> I liked it, but it didn't give me the warm and fuzzies. And I wouldn't expect it to. <laughs> I did think that it was interesting, particularly striking, I think, in this. Or striking mostly because this mimics a couple of other stories in this anthology that we've seen. How the second half of the this, of this story is... I don't want to say separate, but completely different from the first half and takes the form of a letter. I think specifically the fact that we have multiple stories that the second half is a letter, I just found really different from what I was expecting. It makes me think of either the forward or the introduction to this anthology where it's brought up that Chinese storytelling often has a different structure. Mm hmm. I mean, specifically, like, this sure was not a three-act structure story. No, it was not. <laughs> but I think what you're bringing up is how there are quite a few pieces in this work where the first half and the second half are almost reflecting each other in a yeah. way. I, I, guess, I guess what I was wondering, really, was how much of that is a convention of Chinese literature and Chinese science fiction, and how much of that is the authors playing with format. Mm. I think because it was brought up in a structural way to introduce us readers who have no idea what the fuck they're talking about, <laughs> I have to take their word for it. <laughs> that yeah. sounds like it's a larger, a larger. It, it does. Thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that we have two stories, I think it's only two. I could be mistaken about that, but two stories that specifically end with the bulk of the of the ending being a letter like that makes me think that that's something that you see more often and like as a I'm as a format even, are you is the zombie story the other letter one no it's, it's not right it's the, it's the grave one okay because the zombie story also has this sort of reflective structure it it does yeah the zombie story has a very two-part uh, yeah a very a very distinct separation between like the first half and and the ending but i was specifically thinking about the grave story um and i don't recall the title i could look it up but um <laughs> i have pugs on my lap where you get the first half of the story from one perspective and then the second half is uh not completely unrelated but semi unrelated letter i i mean yes I'm agreeing with you, but I am latching onto the letter thing less. I mean, letters and storytelling is super cool and I like them, but I am more struck by the way that the story structure is sort of set up and we get all of the pieces put together and then it brings us to this point. And then instead of sort of following through in that falling structure, we would generally expect to see it then sort of flips it and then is looking at that same thing from either a different perspective or well from a different perspective either from a different character or a different point in time or even just a just a completely different storytelling motif and it and it still continues that plot line but in such a different way it's a it's such an interesting way of of in, interacting with a story I really enjoyed it. And I think I'm not able to really pull the experience apart from jumping to short stories for the first time in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> because short stories do have so much more flexibility with plot structure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think part of my question too is, is, do you see this kind of format as much in longer form Kehuan, or is it just in the short story format? That is a good question, because yeah, I, there's just so. I wish we. I wish we were. I, I wish we were still interviewing Shu Ting and could ask. Quick texter. <laughs> I did really love this story, though, not just because it has Vermeer in it or Vermeer's work <laughs> references to Vermeer's work, also because it has references to delicious founding food. Oh man, the food <laughs> references were so good. I was very hungry reading some of this. I, I was being facetious though. No, the story is very good. Not just because it has delicious sounding food in it. I do love the way it plays with time, kind of similarly to Moon City or the Tide of Moon City, 
the way that we're jumping around in time and we're seeing the same character at different points talking about something and then I don't want to use the word reflections again because I just <laughs> did that I I think that with Pearl Earring though it's much more fluid in that with the Tide of Moon City you as the reader always kind of know where you're oriented in the story yeah and that's much less clear in the, the girl, girl with the Pearl, pearl. Earring <laughs> Mies met the Pearl uh, Mesha met the Parel, yeah. I'm getting farther away from it. The farther away I listened to the Wikipedia lady. <laughs> I had one Dutch class 10 years ago, but it's no help now. <laughs> one more class than me. I agree. I really liked that. This story kept me off balance the entire time, but I had enough context going through it that I never felt completely lost. Mm -hmm. It was more just like being taken on a wild ride. And the character, the main character going through these events was also pretty baffled by them. So I didn't feel alone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, of course, we get the twist about the woman in white who has been creeping and on her <laughs> since her childhood and also maybe seducing her father. <laughs> I don't think she's trying to. I mean, unintentionally seducing her father. I don't think she actually did. No. Uh, no. But, yeah, no, no, I don't think so. But it's funnier her, to say it that way. <laughs> her her father does hold some kind of feelings for the woman in white, but ultimately puts them aside for his wife. I mean, he gets a little obsessed with her. And can you blame him? I mean, I was a little obsessed with her from what we read in this story. <laughs> I mean, Shizuko calls it love at one point. I don't know if you can love someone you don't hang out with. Maybe that's just my definition. <laughs> <laughs> Young love, you know. As the years rolled by, Dad's memory of that girl would have been like a pearl nurtured within its shell, enshrouded in and feeding on layer upon layer of beautiful fantasy until at last it glowed with the perfect light. Yeah, that's so nostalgia. That ain't love. <laughs> I, I think he, I think he loves his his memory of her more than he actually has feelings for the actual woman. But right, like I wouldn't call it the actual act of love. No, <laughs> but uh, you know, obsessed with the concept of her, the the idealized image of her that he's built up. Totally sure. It is cool when you find out she's actually a robot, <laughs> <laughs> and that humans and robots have had well it's implied that they've had lots of wars and the robots have come out on top oh that that implication is so well done and it's it's like glossed over so you can just kind of like not notice it but it's there yeah no there's a there's a long bloody history between humans and ai mm -hmm. in between shizuko and the woman in white's time because the woman in white has traveled back in time to meet shizuko because the obsession is mutual <laughs> <laughs> well the woman in white isn't obsessed with shizuko's father no if that's the mutual you're talking about shizuko's also obsessed with her a little bit not yeah. in the same way yeah but no i i think that's fair yeah they their obsession is much more even footed because it is reciprocated. <laughs> the father is kind of just caught in the crossfires of, yes. uh, of time traveling <laughs> destiny. I don't know. <laughs> it does bring up that idea of, oh, I'm sure there's a pithy phrase, but I'm just going to stumble through <laughs> a bad reference to it. The idea that if someone goes back in time and gives someone the idea for something, where did that idea even come from? Like, circular reasoning and ouroboros yeah. yeah yeah there's there's definitely a bit of that that's being explored through this story and ex explored with no answer which is almost always frustrating but the idea of let's go with ouroboros even though again i'm sure there's some <laughs> some phrase that a better phrase exactly what i'm talking about but i refuse to look it up it brings it up in such a sly way <laughs> And I, I am so okay with that concept as just being baffling. Uh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't need an answer. And that's kind of how I feel about a lot of this 
story. I think <laughs> maybe it's just that Ouroboros aspect of it that I'm referring to, but I feel I like I, I left this story completely overwhelmed and super into it, which is exactly how they felt about the woman in white. So one of the things that I like about a lot of the stories in this actually is that we don't get answers to most of the questions that are that are posed in, in this anthology. Like not entirely, like that's not the case for every single story, but I think it's the case for a lot of stories. They're very open-ended. Uh, so I'm going to argue that you're just describing good science fiction where the mystery is not what's really going on. The mystery is okay, but what does that mean? And yeah, I love it. Give it to me every day. I mean, I think that that's a type of science fiction, not like that's not exclusively the purview of good. I think there's, I think there's a difference uh, how to, how to phrase this. Yes, that is good science fiction, but good science fiction is not only that. I will accept that that is possible, but I have not seen an example of it. <laughs> And maybe that's just me being weird about science fiction. <laughs> that's probably just you being weird about science fiction. Fair enough. <laughs> Either way, I liked that about this anthology and the stories within it. I think it's time to talk about weird words. <laughs> <laughs> it's our last interview question. In the introduction, you mentioned that you tried to translate figurative language as accurately as possible from the original instead of picking a similar idiom in English. And we were wondering if you can recall any of the specific ones that you you had translated. I noticed one that I'm going to try to find, so I'm not just throwing this at you. Um, Great, thank you. I actually think that was one of the footnotes. There's something about a mountain that is apparently a very specific turn of phrase that I would not have understood without that footnote. Oh, that was in um, Anna Wu's story. That one, yes. That one, let me find it. Oh, we didn't talk about that story enough in the first part. I love that painting. And so this story just had like an extra special. Uh, it, some of them resonate more with people just based on their personal experiences. And that was one that got me. <laughs> oh, um, interesting. Yeah, I that I must say that's one of my favorites. I know because of Bach. I read the I read the note. <laughs> that one made me very hungry. All of the talk about food. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. all of the food. Yeah, I was like, oh, I I want to eat this. <laughs> yeah, so Anna is a bit of a foodie herself. <laughs> <laughs> I think that pictures that on. came out that yeah. came out in her writing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The bit in the when she uh, reminisces about going to the canteen and mm -hmm. watching Chef Wang cook with a fire with a wok, uh, yeah, and then the other bit when she's eating lunch, yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite stories. Just the way that Anna writes, she writes really beautifully, very elaborate in a very elaborate and refined way. I find. Uh, with a lots of exquisite detail but also the story is so so lovely about art and ai and and kind of also about growing up and of course there is the science as well <laughs> so there's a hearing and, and you know yeah music as well yeah that one's one of my favorite ones too i i'm really glad we we're focusing on this story because in my previous interviews and podcasts I don't find that we focus on this story and others enough really people have uh we talked about tombs of the universe we talked about cats chance in hell starship library flower of the other shore but but the other ones are yeah the last save as well so i'm really glad we talked about this one <laughs> it's one of my favorites too and tired of moon city definitely so that one, sorry, going back to the going back to the metaphor of so that was the exact line was that uh Xiaozi was as calm as Mount Tai, or he wouldn't even be shaken if Mount Tai had collapsed. That one, right? Yes. So the translation is his face didn't so much as twitch 
giving the impression that even if Mount Tai were about to collapse, he would not. So this actually illustrates quite well my approach to translation in that, of, of course, it's never a literal process. Uh, beyond the, you know, the word order and from primary to secondary language of the sentences, words, there is the proverbs and idioms which are specific to the first language, to the primary language that may be very alien to the secondary language. But I always aim to, rather than finding the equivalent in the secondary language, I would always try to make up a metaphor, like create a metaphor or maybe use words in a way that would encourage the reader to perceive in a new way. So this one is like a four character idiom in Chinese, quite a, a common one in Chinese, but of course not, no context was ever in, in English. <laughs> so I've essentially um, created a metaphor, giving the impression that even if Mount Tai were to collapse, he would not of course, taking a few more words than four characters, <laughs> a few more words than that. But then I've explained in the footnote that, I mean, it would it makes sense, even if you don't look at the footnote, that he's usually a very calm person. He's unfazed, even if, if the mountain is about to collapse. He doesn't. He's unshaken. But then with the footnote, you have a little bit of context where the mountain is and, and its cultural significance. So I'm kind of sneakily introducing this Mount Tai and calm as Mount Tai, I think the more a more literal translation from Chinese would be. But if I said calm as Mount Tai Chi, you'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, so even if Mount Tai would collapse, I'm subtly kind of introducing the idea of Mount Tai and calmness into the English language so that if it gets often used enough, then it becomes a thing <laughs> in the secondary language. So in a way, the metaphor is carried over, not subsumed into the secondary language, but carried over. So there's another one that I remember now from the first story, The Last Safe, where Jerry is looking at the screen he sees an interview with the Time Axis, chairman of the Time Axis, it's page 37, with the situation gnawing at him like an itch from the roots of his teeth. Again, th that is a metaphor that's commonly used in Chinese. It, it, usually it refers to somebody is, who's so un angry and annoyed at something that it's like you're, you're feeling an itching at the, in the depth of your teeth that you can't you know get to <laughs> mm -hmm. so I mean I, I could I could have used something else I guess a bit more familiar or but maybe hyperbole but I thought it wasn't kind of fun and interesting to keep that metaphor and kind of transfer it into English because we are all human at the end of the day and we all experience the emotions in similar ways and probably have similar physical reactions to them. So with the situation gnawing at him like an itch from the roots of his teeth. So yeah, that's does that does that answer the question? Or have I gone totally off the question? Off the there question? wasn't a question. It was a they were it was really yeah. fun to read these new phrases that I was completely unfamiliar with. But like you said, I understood immediately what they were talking about because they are things that we've all been through. I think it's really interesting to have a glimpse of the different idioms that different cultures use and to like come at come at this human experience that we all share from a slightly different perspective which you can still understand but it's like you're you're getting a glimpse into something that's just a little different from your usual um, so I was glad that you didn't translate the the idioms into, you know, English idioms or Western idioms and you kept it as it as it was. I wanted to kind of give an insight into that perspective. Mm -hmm. It's linguistic and therefore cultural as well. Some more examples I've just remembered are like the Great Migration. When we get to the part where they 
have found that there are no longer any tickets left and is this spoiling is this spoiling the story (laughs) it's when they find that they can't get any tickets and they have to find other solutions to getting on that shuttle to go home and then Jung the character remembers that he has made a new friend on the bus and the phrase that came up was treating a dead horse like it's alive now mean the Chinese the, 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 the idiom it's a popular kind of idiom around that's going around that gets used in like stories and tv series and people's conversations so that one again i didn't just want to replace it with something else or was that page 223 we'll have to try and saddle a lame horse oh perfect thank you very much (laughs) (laughs) yeah we have to try and saddle a a lame horse yeah so that's that's what i went with in the end to saddle a lame horse. So not a literal translation, but nevertheless the idea of the right animal and that it's not completely fit <laughs> carried through. <laughs> so that kind of translating is quite challenging. And I mean, whilst the words are not weird in themselves, they they were weird in Chinese and then I have to sort of make them not weird in English (laughs) otherwise major because my my role as an editor is to, my responsibility is towards the reader to make sure that what the the author wants to say is said in, is said well and makes sense and in the most flowing, beautiful way possible. So, yeah. So in a way I have to make it not weird in English. (laughs) It's true. The segment is less words are weird and more language is cool (laughs) i do like this section it's very unique (laughs) well english as the language i'm familiar with has so many strange little quirks things Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah Yeah. and and sometimes they're celebrated and sometimes they're complained about but i like that today we got to celebrate language (laughs) yes i mean even uh because it's spoken so much around the world different regions have their different uses of language yes and certainly between Chinese and English there is a several worlds of difference in not only the word order but lots of cultural differences and also in the way that Chinese has lots of like millions of characters or different characters and then then one word is made up of these characters put together whereas English you have like one word for a concept rather than several words put together but then you you have loads of meanings in that one word and that that, that depends on the context so it's quite interesting to how to navigate through that during the translation. I bet. (laughs) So can you can you tell us a little bit about your current projects, if you have any current projects that you're working on, and then just tell our listeners where you can be found on the internet? Uh, yes. So currently I'm plotting the next books. There will almost certainly be more genre fiction, other types of genre, Chinese <laughs> genre fiction in the pipeline, more collections. I kind of set a roadmap of doing one nonfiction and one fiction. So it's the nonfiction that's due now. And I'm currently talking to publishers about that book and seeing which ideas that have been bubbling in my head they like the sound of. So I'm currently working on that. There's always articles which I publish on my website, uh, snowpavilion.co.uk regularly that are cultural commentary or explaining Chinese culture or sometimes his history, sometimes commentary, sometimes a guided tour. Uh, so you can keep an eye on that. Then I also work with different platforms like um, online sites or yeah, mostly they're online now <laughs> <laughs> and and occasionally write for them too. But you can keep up on on all the news on Twitter. And my website, my Twitter handle is at Xue Ting Ni, which is my name. And then 
other than that, I have a few projects that.、Uh, so yeah, they, there should be more events coming along this year, and then I have some projects that are non-writing, non-text related. Hopefully, other different types, non-book projects <laughs> as well. Well, that all sounds wonderful. We'll of course link to your Twitter and your website in the show notes. And thank you so much for joining us this evening slash afternoon. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. It was really lovely chatting to you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Fiction Fans Pod. You can also email us at fictionfanspod at gmail dot com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and follow us wherever your podcasts live. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.